But I, I would like to, first of all, um, tell you that I actually am happy that I'm presenting last because it gives me an opportunity to sort of provide perspective on what you saw early this morning, this afternoon, which is really compelling science and really the fact that we are at a very unique inflection point in the history of medicine because we're seeing the coalescence of discoveries in genomics and therapeutics that are going to provide unprecedented opportunities uh, to further care and provide uh, help for our patients. But at the same time, this is going to come at increasing costs and large costs at a time when we cannot afford to, to spend more money, but rather look at existing uh, aspects of healthcare and see how we can optimize uh, medical care and provide the best bang for the buck. So in this regard, I'd like to sort of go back and sort of look at opportunities, especially in the environment, as a, a unique uh, pulpit or platform where we can look at opportunities to optimize health uh, for the globe. My, my disclosures are I receive funding from the NIHS and uh, I don't have any other patterns or disclosures to, um, to disclose at this point. Jeffrey Rose is credited with this very seminal observation. He's considered by many to be a transformative epidemiologist who really put together a very fundamental principle in epidemiology, which is a large number of people exposed to a small risk may generate many more cases than a small number exposed to high risk. This is something that we take for granted, right? And I'd like to start my talk with this principle, with this foundational principle, really, in the environment, because although the environment might not uh, seem as a very large risk factor to you, by virtue of the fact that it's ubiquitous, the fact that it's omnipresent, uh, and is uh, present all the time, might have a, a huge impact on global morbidity and mortality, and particularly in cardiovascular disease. Now, this, this observation, I think, it really goes back to many decades ago, and in some ways, one can credit Ansel Keys for the observation, uh, who, through his seven countries study, for those of you who might not know Ansel Keys, Ansel Keys has a lectureship at the American Heart Association every year, and was an epidemiologist who headed a department referred to as environmental hygiene, which I always find a little, you know, kind of interesting in this, in this, uh, in this decade, really. Uh, but Ansel Keys uh, effectively demonstrated that variations in cardiovascular risk uh, are really related to diet and culture, uh, and this, in fact, plays a dominant effect, and that the major risk factors uh, are really universal. And this is what he found through his very important study, the Seven Country Study. Now, this aspect was furthered by Salim Youssef in the Interheart Study, uh, and this is a very seminal observation uh, as part of the Interheart study, which is really one of the first global studies to demonstrate that nine simple modifiable risk factors are strongly associated with myocardial infarction. And in fact, these same nine risk factors account for more than 90% of the population attributable risk globally. Now, this was a very seminal finding because it really uh, magnified this association that all of the factors that we know uh, uh, to be associated with myocardial infarction are all preventable. So we can spend a lot of money and time talking about genomics, but really gets get back to the basics. And especially now, where in certain populations, at least in North America and perhaps in Canada, where there's starting to emerge an uptick in, in the prevalence of cardiovascular disease, this concept is very, very, very important. And so, so much so that implementation science or preventive strategies based on our current knowledge uh, is, uh, is more important today than ever before. Now, this, was, uh, this, 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 this concept was actually, I think, bolstered by a very recent study. This is from the Swedish National Health Registry that took a look at nearly 270,000 patients with diabetes. And this is a relatively complicated slide, but I'd like to point out on the, um, the y-axis, on the left-hand panel, the slide is excess mortality in relationship to the range of risk factor control in this very large uh, Swedish national registry. And the right-hand side of the panel is excess acute myocardial infarction in relationship to the range of risk factor control. And you'll, you'll readily notice that depending on the degree of risk factor control, there's obviously a relationship between not only excess mortality but also excess acute myocardial infarction, so much so that if you take a type 2 diabetic, who had complete control of all their risk factors, the hazard ratio for total mortality and cardiovascular mortality, and we all know that in diabetes, excess mortality to a large extent is driven by 
propensity to acute myocardial infarction can be driven down to, real, uh, to unity. So they're no longer different than a non-diabetic. So this really underscores the concept that even in high-risk populations like type 2 diabetes, uh, the environment, risk factor control may, might indeed play a dominant role. So when we're talking about uh, the word environment, you know, this, it's a very complex, complex topic. So it, it, I think, necessarily deserves attention to what we're talking about. So we can talk about internal environment, and this is often uh, a big focus now. The mind-body connection, I think, is really seeing a renewal of interest, not only because of the fact that people are genuinely interested in seeing what they can do to reduce cardiovascular risk, but also because of innovations and technology that allow us the ability to really start to probe the connections between the brain and the mind. So this is, there are also personal environmental factors, and this is a very dumbed-down version of it, and diet was one of them. We, we talked about this uh, through the studies of Ansel Keys. There's also things like sleep, physical activity, belief systems, uh, attitudes, et cetera, which is part of the internal environment. Then you have the social environment, which is a huge factor. That includes things like culture, personal and professional relationships, health services, and then you have a natural environment. Um, and the exposure to all of these factors, as many people have coined the word exposome, is the totality of influences in the environment that um, collectively conspires, if you will, with genetics to, uh, uh, to uh, predispose individuals to cardiovascular events. And the pollutome is a concept referred to a small group of uh, perhaps a large group of uh, chemicals uh, that could collectively conspire to increase uh, risk for cardiovascular disease uh, and generally referred to as chemicals in the physical environment that people are exposed to. So a very recent document going back to approximately two years ago put together by Phil Landrigan. Uh, this is a Lancet Commission trying to look at the footprint of environmental factors and global mortality put forth these estimates. These are based on the global burden of disease where they try to trying to come together with, with a footprint, if you will, of the pollutome. And again, this is a very limited exercise, but nonetheless a very important exercise to quantitate the influence of the pollutome. So you can see uh, on this slide that the impact globally of the total uh, pollutome is roughly around 9 million uh, lives uh, annually. And when you look at uh, the contribution of things like air pollution, you'll see that uh, uh, the pollutome contributes to 16% of all global deaths, uh, and this is three times larger than all of the deaths attributable to tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria combined. So this is a huge problem, and this, again, the footprint is an absolute underestimate, because when you, when you really start looking at more sophisticated ways of um, uh, addressing this problem, and these are some recent estimates looking at the the burden of disease contributed to by air pollution, for instance. And this is using some revised estimates called the GEM model. 8.9 million deaths in 2015, uh, which is much larger than what the global burden of disease uh, estimated previously in the Lancet document that I just showed you. And the vast majority of these deaths attributable globally are related to cardiovascular disease. Um, so what do we know about the internal environment uh, and cardiovascular disease? Well, this is a slide depicting the relationship between uh, attitudes and belief systems and, and personality attributes, shown here on the x-axis, attributes that we normally uh, ascribe to type A personality, for instance, time urgency in patients, achievement, striving, competitiveness, and things like depression and anxiety. And the y-axis is hypertension incidence. And this is part of a large prospective study called CARDIA, showing that these attributes do indeed predispose individuals to future development of hypertension. Then you have the well-known association between depression and cardiovascular disease. This is a meta-analysis of uh, 54 studies showing very nicely that there's a very strong relationship uh, between uh, depression and uh, cardiovascular risk. And this has, been, uh, this has led to many unsuccessful attempts at trying to address therapeutic modulation with very, very crude uh, therapeutic modalities, but this is going to be a huge uh, area of opportunity in the future. Sleep is well known to be a critical determinant of internal environment, both uh, short sleep, uh, abbreviated sleep, as well as excessive sleep are both associated with excess uh, cardiovascular risk. So the internal environment is indeed a powerful uh, mediator of cardiovascular disease. Both negative health behaviors and psychosocial risk factors, I think, are very, very dominant and increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, often in a synergistic fashion, 
and this might be a, a real opportunity for, uh, for future um, 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 interventions to mitigate this association. And there's already starting to be some very interesting studies trying to tease out this association between cardiovascular risk and, uh, and um, uh, neuronal connections, and this is a very um, um, coded study from my colleague Emma Tavoko, published in Lancet in 2017, that showed in a patient population of 300 um, uh, individuals with no prior history of cardiovascular disease or cancer, that there was a very strong association uh, after multivariate adjustment for a number of other covariates between amygdalar activity and cardiovascular events. And amygdalar activity is actually a surrogate and perhaps even a mediator for, stressful, uh, for stress. And this is a correlation showing in a subset of those individuals that amygdalar activity is very powerfully correlated with stress. So this might be a real opportunity where we start to understand the biologic underpinnings of how attitudes or internal environmental factors may collectively conspire to increase cardiovascular risk in the future. What do we know about the external environment cardiovascular disease? Now, we all know from a number of um, uh, published studies that where you live is a very important determinant of future risk for cardiovascular disease. And in many ways, the zip code is really a surrogate marker for a number of uh, things, including access to medical care, uh, geographic disparities, uh, increased prevalence of risk factors, access to food, a number of other things. And in this map, you clearly see that the high prevalence of disease along the Mississippi Valley in contrast, you have areas in the west, western part of the United States where there are relatively lower rates of cardiovascular disease. So starting to tease out the contribution of various socioeconomic factors that might again co-segregate with factors like stress might be a very important opportunity. Um, then there are studies like this which show that with natural environment exposure to green space, uh, and this slide is a very interesting exercise that took 41 million uh, citizens of the United Kingdom who were before retirement and tried to look at the association between exposure to green space, shown here along the um, uh, x-axis, and the incidence of um, incident, uh, incident rate ratios, if you will, of all-cause mortality on the left-hand side of the slide and deaths from circulatory disease on the right-hand side. And what is readily apparent is that Increasing exposure to green space after adjustment of multiple covariates reduces or attenuates the relationship of income. Um, and income here is shown in the various colors and, and blue and green. And you can see increasing exposure to green space markedly reduces this uh, disparities, which we, now, we, we know to be true. That the more you are economically well off, there's clearly um, a lower um, incidence of cardiovascular disease. And, uh, and economic distress is often a surrogate for increased um, susceptibility to cardiovascular disease. What about air pollution? We started, I started off my talk showing you uh, some important statistics, and this is a slide showing you that actually, thanks to increasing anthropogenic emissions in countries, rapidly developing countries, and countries like China and India, that the uh, percentage of, uh, of, of the population living above the World Health Organization interim target level uh, of particulate matter greater than 2.5 microns, defined as 35 microgram per meter cube, actually increased uh, over the last decade. And out of all the components, obviously air pollution is a very complex mixture, uh, particulate matter 2.5 microns or uh, particles below uh, 2.5 microns uh, have been consistently shown to be associated with cardiovascular risk. And indeed, when you look at exposure dose response functions, there indeed does not seem to be a lower threshold below which this risk uh, abates. Case in point, here's some very um, recent data from, uh, from, from Canada where the air quality is relatively pristine, but the average PM2.5 levels uh, somewhere annual averages range anywhere from 5 to 10 microgram per meter cube, much better than down, down below. Uh, but there's still a continuing relationship uh, uh, to cardiovascular death, cardiovascular mortality, and very low levels of PM2.5. And uh, we now know that there are many, many different mechanisms in play, and this is uh, illustrated in this slide, where PM2.5 could increase susceptibility to cardiovascular disease to a variety of different intermediate mechanisms, through an increase in susceptibility to hypertension, increased susceptibility to insulin resistance and diabetes, and through atherosclerosis, perhaps increase your risk for myocardial infarction. 
And in this regard, it also might synergistically conspire with other risk factors in your environment, such as noise. And here are some uh, recent mechanistic uh, data from Mesa, where they showed that for every five microgram per meter cube increase in 2.5, there was actually an increase in progression of coronary calcification in the Mesa cohort. So some of you looking at this might go, well, you know, the future is pretty bleak. What do we do now? Especially because air pollution is not a problem that's going to go away tomorrow. It's going to take concerted uh, governmental action, and it's probably going to be decades before there's going to be changes in levels in countries like India and China. So what do we do now? Well, the good news is if, you, if, 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 if the uh, governments of the world so desire this, this can be this can be instantaneous. And this is a modeling exercise published recently in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences showing that if you actually turn off fossil fuel emissions, and this is the thought, ex thought experiment, um, you can globally reduce 3.6 million lives in a year, right? An elimination of all anthropogenic emissions would save 5.55 million deaths per year. And this can be done, and you, you, you've seen this in this very country, uh, in Canada and in, uh, in the United States, where over the last two decades, air pollution levels have plummeted. And this is translated into gain in um, uh, lifespan, reduction in cardiovascular mortality, and reduction in overall mortality. So it can be done. And with the recent shift, even in China, to more green uh, sources of uh, energy production, this could, very, this could be uh, it's easily accomplishable. And then there's the other argument about how emissions might actually influence climate. And I don't know how many of you uh, are politically incentive, but I can show you positive proof of global warming here. And this indeed is a phenomenon. You don't have to believe in any of the science, but I can tell you that this is actually happening. And emissions can indeed influence climate. And this is from the same paper that showed that reductions in phase out of air pollution emissions would lead to substantial increase in precipitation or rainfall in many parts of the globe where currently there are droughts. And this is shown here in this relatively complex slide. So there can be substantial co-benefits in terms of greening of the environment that could also have collateral benefits in terms of cardiovascular health. So this is obviously a complex topic. This is not something that we as physicians or, or uh, people involved in uh, the health sector can solve alone. This is an extremely complex problem. And the solution is equally complex because it's going to in involve uh, technology, economists, social scientists working together with um, people in the health sector to make an impact and on very complex social problems. But it can be done. And these are some of the things that we might need to do in order to make an impact uh, on air pollution. And certainly, as health professionals, we can make an impact uh, on our patients in terms of promoting healthy behaviors and improving psychosocial uh, function, uh, which might indeed translate into reductions in cardiovascular death. So I'll leave you with a thought from Jeffrey Rose again uh, in conclusion. Uh, and, and the primary determinants of disease are mainly economic and social. And this is indeed a very prophetic statement to make. And therefore, its remedies must also be economic and social. Medicine and politics cannot and should not be kept apart. So thank you. I'll stop here and thank many of my collaborators whom I've had the privilege of working with over the last 20 years. Thank you again.